Hello, everybody. My name is Matthew Kleinman. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Kansas School of Architecture and Design. I also co-founded Dot Agency, and I work as a research assistant for Wayne Inn, which is a program of Children's Mercy Kansas City Hospital and in the Center for Children's Healthy Lifestyles and Nutrition. So this is a presentation for the conference, the, inter the 11th International Conference on the Constructed Environment, and uh, it represents a, a few years of the work that I've been a, fortunate to have been a part of in Wyandotte County, Kansas, and dot, with dot agency. So I'll say more about that in a second. So just as a little bit of background, um, when I was an, an undergraduate student at the University of Kansas School of Architecture, I played for the Kansas basketball team. And, and I thought because I was an architect uh, student in sports that someday I might be a uh, sports architect and so I had opportunities to do internships around the time I graduated I saw buildings like this one the bird's nest by Herzog and the Miron come out in uh, Beijing and I got to visit it and I thought man wouldn't that be cool to be a sports architect in the world as a, as a former athlete but what I really worked on were large-scale urban design projects um, shortly after graduate school in urban design I returned to Kansas City and one of the projects that really kind of sat with me was a project for the East Police Station where uh, four city blocks of a neighborhood were cleared to make way through the use of eminent domain for a police station and it really struck me that there was a missed opportunity to work with the community to envision what they would like to see in their neighborhoods what I do now is effectively that. I work to bring people together uh, through convening, through getting to know the neighborhoods I work with, connecting with people, and then organizing them to make decisions together about what they would like to see in their neighborhoods. Just as a little bit of background in public participation in design, it is a, a rich field with lots of history. And for about the last hundred years, there's a few names that stand out and inspire me in the work I do today. Uh, Clarence Perry describes a lot about the, the, the neighborhood unit, the idea that when you get people from a certain size of place together, they can actually really build up uh, their community, the built environment in the, the mutual interest uh, with each other. Um, Sherry Ernstein talks about the ladder of citizen participation, this idea that when the model cities came through in the 1960s and she saw a lot of neighborhoods being planned for, but not with, and she defined her ladder of citizen participation as, a, as kind of a, a threshold moment for a lot of planners and architects who saw this idea that citizen control really kind of rises above what typically gets called community engagement. Paul Davidoff is an urban planner who talks a lot about advocacy planning and pluralism and planning, but what he really gets to is this idea that uh, rather than have top down master plans or architects or planners hired as a consultant for the city and really responding to the client's interest in the city. What if communities could afford design and planning what if they could have architects and planners work on their behalf as advocates and present multiple plans or plural plans that really could kind of come through consensus and consent to a decision about what was best for the community. And then Whitney M. Young Jr., a civil rights leader, not an architect or planner, but his address to the 1968 AIA convention calling architects uh, largely irrelevant on the issues of social justice in the civil rights era. And basically said that, you know, you are thunderous in your silence. And that critique is what has spawned a whole lot of community uh, led design initiatives in, in, in this area uh, that you might call public interest design. Um, but to say a little bit more, there's not just those individuals, there's a lot of institutions and organizations in the paper um, that's on, on the Constructed Environment Conference site. Um, I talk about a few of them, but two that stand out are Arnstein's Ladder, which I mentioned before, talking about non-participation. And as you empower community members to be more active participants in the built environment. They rise up through tokenism and citizen power. There's been a lot of work in the last 50 years done on that very conversation. But when you look at it in a new light, there's other groups that are working on it. So the International Association for Public Participation is an active organization that trains and you know brings people the tools and skills they need to move from this idea of informing communities to empowering them. And almost everything you know, I've been a part of as an architect, as a designer in the last six years has really kind of been on that same journey, going from informing a community to really trying to find ways to empower them. Now, in this world of public interest design, there is you know, some education involved. Uh, there are academic leaders in this field. And these are three that I've had the good fortune to be inspired by, and a couple of them I've had the good opportunity to meet. But Brian Bell at the Design Corps in North Carolina State, uh, he created the SEED Network, which is a great uh, a framework for socially engaged design. Dan Patera at the Detroit Center for Design Collaboration has been um, doing incredible work in Detroit and at the University of uh, Detroit Mercy. And Sam Mockaby's Rural Studio, if you ask anyone in the design build world, they would call Rural Studio as kind of the North Star of, of community participatory engagement and design build. And his work has been 
um, influential for many architects and, and professors alike. Other resources that have inspired this world, um, going back to folks like Stanley King, who looked at co-designing with youth as a process that architects could engage with back in the 1970s. Henry Sanoff is kind of the, the godfather of community planning participation, and his work has been very influential in my work. Um, Randolph Hester worked with others to write this book, Design as Democracy, really exploring the methods about how when you use participatory design right, what you're really doing is practicing democracy. It's letting people come together to make decisions, whether it's participatory budgeting or mapping, anything where participation is at the core of the exercise, you're really allowing people to come together and make decisions together. It's not a yes, no vote. It is a how do we create a, uh, bring about a creative solution to this problem. And so that is a conversation for designers to be engaged in because how you design that framework is a part of the design process. And then recently there's been incredible work out of Singapore. I think participate, participate in design as, as a studio published this excellent book with all the, the methods that they've been using out in the community. And I, I'm really enjoying reading it in the last couple of years. But I'll be honest, most of this work has been in a mostly white profession. And so there has been a new movement towards design justice and uh, planners like James Rojas and his Place It movement. Uh, Place It method is a great way to bring communities together to talk about social just justice issues in the built environment. And the design justice platform, and there are a few of them, but specifically design as protest collective uh, led by Brian C. Lee Jr., Dee Nichols, uh, Michael Ford, and... Um, Ms. Holloway, they're bar none doing the most incredible work right now. And I encourage you all to check out the Designers Protest Collective and, and the demands that they're putting out there. Um, I think they're really moving this field of community design forward. And, and the reason this paper is called Community Health Design is because I graduated with an architecture degree. I went to graduate school for urban design. The difference between those two is the architecture degree was accredited and it came with a certain specific set of requirements and that included the, the books we would read and the lessons we were taught and the, the types of projects we'd work on. And for a few years, you do that work and you come away with a accreditation and you go get your uh, diploma and you work for a few years as an architect and now you are a licensed architect. The, the, the society says that we trust you to do this work well. Well, I went to graduate school in urban design and none of that exists because urban design as a profession is not a accredited body. Um, but that doesn't mean that urban design just still doesn't have a value. And for that same reason, uh, I'm, this paper and this video is really about putting forth this idea that community health design ought to be uh, more uh, focused and considered than it currently is in academic and practice as it relates to the built environment. And I'll talk more about how certain projects I've experienced play into that. But specifically, I want to just point at these two pictures that the Congress for International Architectural, you know, Modern Architecture, SIAM, as it's commonly known, about 100 years ago, met. And there's a few members of that group that spun off and had their own theories. But the one that speaks closest to me is Gian DiCarlo De Carlo, who spoke about how architecture is too important to be left to architects, that it affects all of our lives, whether or not we're a part of it. And a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to be a part of the AIA Design Justice Summit in New Orleans, and so many of the best and brightest architects around the country in the United States participated in that. I was very fortunate to be a part of it. Frankly, I, I probably was well over in over my head, but I was so inspired by the work that they're doing. And I just want to acknowledge that the, 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 this movement towards racial justice is one that we are all a part of, we can all participate in, and we ought to demand better of our profession and of our built environment to correct for the historic injustices that are embedded in our everyday lives. And so there's a couple examples in this video and paper that I want to present as, as examples of what that looks like when we start to frame that work as community health design. Now, it's a well-known fact that our built environment shapes our public health, whether it's Jon Snow's ghost maps, uh, looking at the cholera outbreak where he was mapping door by door, canvassing to figure out whether cholera was a function of the bad air of cities or if it was actually about the sewer infrastructure and how that had been contaminated. It might be in the Homeowners Loan Corporation redlining maps, and this map shows Kansas City, the areas in red, where the federal government basically said, you cannot get a loan in these neighborhoods, but what they didn't do, and though we now know they did, but what they didn't explicitly say was that these are heavily racist maps. And so realtors use them, banks use them to explicitly deny generational wealth to black and brown communities. Communities of color were, were left out of the home buying and building and renovation process for many years because of maps that were drawn that systemically disinvested communities across the country. And today we see how that has built environment, those built environment impacts have public health outcomes. And so the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation annually or 
almost every year, publishes county health rankings. And so in 2012, where I work in Wyandotte County and where I live now, um, those county health rankings looked at Kansas City especially, and they found that in some cases the difference in Kansas City, Missouri was 14 years. I can tell you that those maps are being updated right now. And in Wyandotte County, which I'll talk about shortly, the difference in life expectancy based on where you're born is 24 years on average, which means if you live on the east side of Kansas City, Kansas, your life expectancy might be in the range of 58 years, where if you live out west in Piper, Kansas, it might be 24 years more. Now, there's a lot of factors in there, but irrespective of just your wealth or your poverty, the built environment has impact. Air quality, highways, um, water quality, plumbing, housing quality, lead paint, all of these things impact you and they get tied back to how our built environment is shaped. It's not a surprise. Public health knows about this. There's a lot of work being done right now. The CDC calls for us to design healthy communities. There are prominent researchers that are working directly with urban planning and architecture. I'll just call out a few. Andy Dannenberg, Lawrence Frank, Howard Frumkin, Richard Jackson, and James Salas are all making a very compelling case that the built environment shapes our physical activity and our access to healthy food. And yet we don't have a specialized approach towards designing for healthy communities. When it comes to Wyandotte County, where I currently work with DOT Agency, um, DOT Agency is a portmanteau of spatial agency. So about six years ago, uh, we framed, and then that'd be 2015, 2016, we framed DOT Agency uh, based on this concept of spatial agency coming out of uh, the work of Jeremy Till, Tatiana Schneider, and Nishad Awan. And we looked at how there are other ways of doing architecture. Just because you don't build a building doesn't mean you can't use your skills to uh, creatively map and solve problems and, and create space and design in a way that actually brings value to the community, um, even if it's not quote unquote architecture because you're not working for a firm. And unfortunately, we were a part of the University of Kansas. So we were training our students to both design buildings and projects while also engaging them in this idea of community organizing towards public health with a design build approach. In Wyandotte County, we're kind of in the heart of Kansas, but we're in the northeast corner of the state, and we're actually one of the most diverse counties in the country. There's no ethnic majority in the community. Um, it is a very diverse community, but the county and the cities within it merged about 20 some years ago. And so what we see is a very dense urban condition with high rates of poverty east of a major highway 635 dividing line, and you move into the middle third, it's suburban, and the western third, it's rural. But the majority of our work with that agency is in the eastern and really the northeastern corner of Wyandotte County, working with residents directly. Um, I, I should acknowledge my colleagues, Shannon, Chris, and Niels Gore. They're uh, a big reason why I'm able to do any of this work. Um, they have been uh, great mentors to me, and they've been an incredible part of my life, uh, helping me understand how to navigate academia and working in a community design setting. So thank you to Shannon, Chris, and Niels Gore. And any future students that are encouraged to, to work with that agency, reach out to them, and they'll be happy to guide you along the way. But early on, our student prototypes were really trying to challenge our students to respond to the health concerns that they were hearing from community partners, and then prototype, adapt, iterate, bring your design thinking skills to the built environment in a way that could improve public health outcomes. And so one example was a student who used about $200 at Home Depot, bought off the shelf parts and heard that there was a lack of wayfinding and connectivity in neighborhood parks. And at that, there emerged six uh, permanent installations within parks that were designed and built by DOT agency. Um, Shannon has worked very closely with neighborhood leaders across the Northeast area. I think just last week we conducted our sixth neighborhood walking audit. This audit tool called Come Walk With Us was developed by the residents of the Northeast area with architects and, and Shannon's help. And it's a much more uh, specific visualization of block by block, you know, foot by foot, where are there improvements that need to be made in our sidewalks, our street lights, our, our streets, and our curbs. Um, I've worked firsthand with Niels on design build projects, and one of those was working with students from Emmy Pearson Elementary, where we asked them to envision what a uh, community tool shed, maybe a garden learning center could be. And that, that turned into this uh, really elegant structure built by architecture students, but first designed with the students at Emmy Pearson Elementary School at Split Log Farm and Tool Shed. And we've been fortunate enough to actually work directly with our community health partners, especially those at KU Medical Center. Uh, Nikki Nolan's students partnered with us for a couple of semesters teaching uh, architects and public health students how to listen, some of the methods of card sorting and photo voice, and really turning that power over to the residents to help tell their own stories. And because of all this early work, we, we sat down, Shannon and I did, and tried to define what are the principles of engagement that we're engaging in? What are we doing? What guides us? What, are the, what, what binds us together and continues our momentum forward? And what we 
thought important to do is acknowledge that this is work that's been done before, but it hasn't always crossed over to the world of design. And so what we found most influential was the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes for Health had commissioned a report in 2012, and it looked at the best examples of community engagement in public health. Well, we took that and adapted it. We made it principles of engagement for participatory design. And I would argue that that's now not just participatory design, it's for community health design, because what we do is community health design, if not anything else, it's, it's working with communities to improve health outcomes. Um, but it's a process and it's one that we realize is somewhat iterative because when you go through each stage of it by the ninth principle, it's basically saying you got to stick around and you'll see more projects like the one you started on emerge because the relationships get built, trust is formed, partnerships emerge, and new opportunities come along a way to address the next systemic disinvestment challenge in the built environment. And so this is an iterative sort of roadmap that public health professionals have said, this is how we should practice public health. We try to translate it for architects and urban planners and designers, and we hope that that's a value. For us, what it looks like is we started very early on with this approach in things like the Jersey Creek Fitness Trail Stations. They're called fitness trail stations because initially the community wanted a park bench. This, you know, sprawling park, Jersey Creek, had no place to sit. And so community residents said, well, we would go to the park more frequently to be physically active if we could sit down every once in a while. Well, the park benches that they had weren't in great condition. And so they said, could we get a new park bench? We went to our funder, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and they said no, because seating is sedentary behavior. And so the ingenuity of our architecture students working alongside community members re-envisioned the park bench as a Jersey Creek Fitness Trail Station, and Niels Gore and his students prototyped and built a few, and eventually got the funding to build and install five of these along the Jersey Creek Trail. Uh, from this work, we started recognizing that Grant funding alone is not enough to solve the historic disinvestment of just one park. There's many parks like this in every major US city, especially those that have been disinvested. And so we looked at this idea that we could organize our communities together across racial, ethnic, community boundary, territorial lines, and tried to define a corridor called the Healthy Community Corridor that represented over the half the county's population, living in about 12% of its geographic area where more than half the county's parks were, but that is not where more than half the county's park investments were. And so we would hear firsthand about how certain parks were invested in where marinas and roads at the, the, the regional jewel parks would get millions of dollars, but neighborhood parks that people could walk to wouldn't receive the same amount of investment. So we took it upon ourselves to start to lift up those causes, help promote those events, create new events and create new opportunities for people to be physically active. We did this work not on our own volition, but partnering directly with community leaders in this space. I'll lift up to Roger Cropford on the on the right, looking up at the man in purple who's a county commissioner, um, was a great leader with New Bethel Church Community Development Corporation and continues to be a champion for all health equity projects throughout Wyandotte County and on a national level. Our other community partner is Rachel Jefferson, who has been a great ally in this work. And uh, since our initial Rocky start in the image on the right, I think she might have called me out in a meeting because I got something wrong on a map. She is now one of our best allies in doing this work together. And she runs Groundwork NRG, uh, stands for Northeast Revitalization Group, which is a health equity and environmental justice organization that I'll talk about here in a little bit. But Broderick had this idea that if you actually looked at how many people could get to Jersey Creek, you might find that there's a public health incentive for the city to invest more in those parks. And sure enough, when we drew those maps, we found that about 20,000 people live within walking distance of the Jersey Creek Park. So visualizing that, building that map brought power to our community partners who now had demands and could show that the maps backed them up. So public health data has utility in the built environment in this way. But we also started noticing that there was a disinvestment from things like ADA curb ramps that were installed because of the consent decree. Uh, the accessibility features were great for the curb, but there was no sidewalks. And so policy shapes, the politics and policy also shape our built environment and how that affects health. In the creek itself, we noticed that stormwater sewage drains out into the creek. And so when it rains too much, Jersey Creek becomes a raw sewage dumping area and sewage runs along to the river. There's a multi-million dollar plan that the EPA has required Wyandotte County to do to remedi remediate this issue. But unfortunately, it's not happening really upstream. Literally, it's happening before it hits the river. And so a lot of our work is about advocating to work with the community residents because Broderick and I have heard firsthand and we've done community health design workshops that kids are running into the creek because a basketball rolls down there from a basketball court. And then they're taking that ball and going back and playing with it with all of that stuff on their hands. 
And so this is an environmental justice issue. It's also a public health issue. And these are the types of things that advocacy and mapping and design can speak to. Specific to Jersey Creek, we were fortunate to work with community partners and, and those that I mentioned earlier, but also worked with Gale Institute. I, it was a short-lived institute coming out of Jan Gale's urban design firm, one of the best urban designers in, this, in the world. Um, but they had a method for doing park observations and public space observations. And we applied and we were fortunate to be one of the three organizations across the country to participate with them in this. We hired community mobilizers to measure the rate of physical activity and access to spaces across the park. But we noticed these other things too. We noticed that signage was extremely negative. It was telling people to stay away, danger, warning, no, basically saying no fun. And the signs that were there promoting the park were broken, just like the park benches. And we learned later that the park benches were broken because when they were done by a community group originally with no long-term maintenance plan, the city wouldn't touch them out of a concern that there'd be a liability once they take a possession and ownership of them. That was the story that we were told. And, and as advocates, we have since corrected this and built new benches, but it's one of those things that until you're in the room speaking the same language as architects and planners and designers, it's sometimes hard to get that information out and assumptions and, and misinterpretations are easy to have um, when you're in the built environment space. And so there was a lot of misinterpretations around the types of work that we were doing before we started working and trying to understand how the built environment was definitely impacted by policies, but then also could impact public health. We also taught ourselves some stuff. We, we didn't realize, but if you looked at just demographics, you might have assumed that one of the park shelters we were working at was in an area that was predominantly black. But because the school district is predominantly Latino, we had a much larger population come out for a, a, a young birthday party and the birthday boys sleeping here. I actually got to know the, the family and participated by being their informal photographer. So building trust through documented storytelling is a great way that community health design can train young aspiring professionals to be there to help tell the stories, to, to share and be an accessible resource. And so what was incredible is the lighting, the balloons, the tablecloths, some of the tables themselves were brought by the community. The community was reshaping the space to encourage active use of a park, which encourages physical activity. In addition to the methods we were given by the Gale Institute, we added one more, which was a participatory mapping tool. It wasn't well thought out, but we tried to prototype a tool of using the 12 urban quality criteria that Jan Gale initially you know, created, but simplifying them so that they'd be accessible in, in the language and in the framing of them to any community participant to be able to tell us where would they like to see certain installations go. And it worked. We had seniors from the Parkwood Colony Neighborhood Association. We had youth coming to the Heathwood Spray Park coming out and explaining to us through the use of this participatory mapping tool, which we framed as a game, what they would like to see in their neighborhood. Where would things go? And we heard so many stories, stories about how sidewalks that were broken were dangerous for their kids to walk on, but that was the only way to get from the parking lot, parking lot to the park. We heard about areas that the brush had overgrown, which was unsafe. Kaboom playgrounds had installed a new playground, but no parents wanted to let their children go there because they would have to cross an area that was considered a, a drug dealing space. And that was not well maintained. We also, enlisted our friends at Youth Build Kansas City, Kansas. I, I worked for them shortly after this project as, as an employee, but our friend Spark Bookhart, who's the executive director there and featured in this photo facing the camera, uh, Spark had a, a wealth of young people in the community who really wanted to make a difference. And they saw that the construction trade skill was their way to get their GED and get a couple years of training and employment and go off into the world. Um, we enlisted them partially because we understood that showing up with a bunch of white students from the University of Kansas might not cut it anymore. We were aware that the privilege we had as architects, not from Wyandotte County at that time, um, wasn't appropriate for working with communities. So what we worked to do is in build up partnerships with Youth Build and Groundwork Energy and NBC CDC so that they could align their efforts and actually let the youth from the community build the installations that the community wanted to see. Um, and I'll mention that that park bench there was an example of framing roof joists. So the, the young people were able to learn trade skills and, and, and framing walls and um, you know, digging foundations all throughout this process. In addition to that, we designed some signage. Uh, this was borrowed liberally from the Mayo Clinic. And I should add the, some of the elements we worked on with Youth Build were borrowed from the tiny WPA projects out of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, and then also from the Making Our Own Space group out of Cleveland, Ohio. So thank you to you all for your, for, you know, your inspiration. But this came from the Mayo Clinic, and they had put up park signage encouraging people to be physically active in short bites. We redesigned those, we borrowed new research, and we pulled together some very quick 
um, ideas about physical activity, specifically about reducing type 2 diabetes. This was a, under the umbrella of a grant called the 1422 grant, which I talk about in the paper a little bit more with the Community Health Council of Wyandotte County. And we wanted to introduce this idea that physical activity in your park would be a great way to reduce your A1C levels, which it is, uh, but to do so in a friendly way by taking down the signs that said, no, don't, you can't, um, taking down signs that had, had bullet holes for years and never been replaced. But because of our observations in the park with our community mobilizers, especially as a participant in the process, we identified the opportunity to introduce bilingual signage because that was what the community um, there wanted to see. And so we were fortunate to have our community mobilizers as residents from the neighborhood participate in this process with us. And I'll just wrap up by saying on this one project, uh, the stories we heard afterwards were really beautiful. Kids love playing on seesaws, uh, which are no longer allowed in most cities because of liability. Um, but also the, the resident on the left told us a story about how her doctor had encouraged her to ride her bike nearby and her A1C levels were high. And so our park signage encouraging her to reduce her A1C levels hit her at the right moment. And she sat down and told a story with us about what it meant for her to see the park uh, be redesigned and, and see it be invested in. And so we were proud to, to hear those stories and share those stories. And, and that's part of the work of community health design. The second project I want to talk about is a dot mobile grocer. Um, it's a opportunity to increase food access. Uh, mobile markets are a way to bring food to people. And in Wyandotte County, that same area where the majority of the residents live, there was only five grocery stores that carried WIC, which is the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. West of the 635 Highway were 10 WIC grocery stores, predominantly big box grocery stores. Think Walmarts and Targets. Um, but when we looked at the material out there at the time, mapping efforts looking at food deserts had taken a sort of a top-down data-heavy approach. And one of the mistakes that they had made was they had looked at the local wholesale grocers' uh, corporate headquarters and assumed that that was a grocery store because grocery was in the name. It wasn't. And so it, it encourages community health design to really ground truth the data, not rely upon data, not rely upon smart data, smart cities, technology, or apps, but to really work with people. Work with people who understand the context in the community. Thinking of Clarence Perry's term, the neighborhood unit. If you're not working with the neighborhood unit, it is very difficult to talk about food access. We worked with community health workers. The Community Health Council of Wyandotte County had hired these community health workers and they were kind of a new model uh, at the rollout of the ACA or Obamacare to promote uh, culturally relevant community health assistance somewhere between social working, nursing and kind of a, a community support staff. Um, they helped us redefine what the food map of Wyandotte County would look like. And we pr printed thousands of booklets that were handed out in four different languages, showing over 120 destinations, community gardens, urban farms, uh, pantries, anywhere that you could find food in Wyandotte County, the food map could participate with, or you could, you could find it using the food map. What that led us to was working with Humana Health Insurance. So healthcare started to notice the work we were doing and they wanted to see if we would be interested to in solve some of the challenges we were running into in terms of increasing access to WIC. And the idea of a mobile market came to us and we worked to develop it further. I did the drawing on the left and the participatory engagement and budgeting on the right. And so we started visioning this idea of a mobile market, what it could look like in reality using architecture design, design skills and then using participatory mapping and planning to evaluate the feasibility of the idea. And that gave way to dot agency work where students in architecture and design build started to fabricate. Eventually we were able to buy a truck through health grant funding and through more partnerships and more healthcare dollars, we were able to fully fabricate a mobile market, which is refrigerated. Uh, Niels Gore deserves a lot of the credit here. He built it and it was his studio that came up with a lot of the prototypes for how the shelving and different elements of the mobile market would work. My responsibility was much more aligned with how the mobile market would actually operate. Initially, uh, the idea was to get a mobile market community council. So we recruited residents using Facebook, social media flyers, all kinds of emails to bring residents to the table and have them help make decisions. Initially, this was with a nonprofit as the backbone organization. Um, and what we introduced was a model of shared governance or also known as collaborative governance. But it's a vehicle, uh, it's a pardon the pun, that community health design ought to be looking into. It sort of replaces the idea of a board structure to some degree, um, because what it does is it puts those who are most affected by decisions made for them in the decision-making chair. And so there are still people with authority and power who are part of the 
community council and can uh, speak to specific issues, but it was residents who had decision making power and they made decisions through consensus and consent. There's a lot more research and a lot more to be said about that process. But just know that for community health designers, sometimes designing by committee is not so bad because we had community health, uh, you know, experts from their neighborhoods talking about how it would be to work in certain environments, work with certain community groups, where locations should be, where the map should go. They changed the zoning ordinances uh, to let mobile markets park in non-commercial areas. They invited more community participation to tell us what food items to stock. Having mobile market community council and residents lead the mobile dot mobile grocer, they named it dot mobile grocer after the idea of Y and dot county made this project sustainable. When the nonprofit eventually dropped out, it was the Mobile Market Community Council that stuck together, formed their own nonprofit, and they continued to operate the Dot Mobile Grocer. Since October of 2020 till about April 2021, they've handed out over, I think, 15,000 USDA food to uh, farm to families food boxes. Um, and that's a, at a value of a little over $500,000 provided to Wyandotte County. The community council made those decisions. They got the mobile grocer on the road. And the photo on the right illustrates them advocating for more food access in their community when they had Charisse, Congresswoman Sharice Davids come to visit. So empowering your community as a part of the community health design process, helping them become the leaders, bring the methods and decide not just what's right for their community, but working to advocate for more communities to have access to healthy food, safe places to play, streets. They are working towards uh, launching the Dot Mobile Grocer as a full service grocery store. They actually just received their business license to the, today. So congratulations to the Mobile Market Community Council and their mission is to bring fresh, affordable food to Wyandotte County. The third and final project I'll talk about is Project Pipeline KC. In 2014, I was working as an uh, adjunct professor of architecture at the University of Kansas, and I applied to a community engagement fellowship in New Orleans at, with the architecture firm SQ Dumez and Ripple. And so at the time, I was really curious about community engagement. I had just come out of the architecture practice trying to think, how do we do this thing better? And so I learned a lot. And so SQ Dumez and Ripple, thank you for your support. I learned sometimes how it is done poorly. Developer, not EDR, uh, had had a meeting where the community engagement occurred literally at the 25th hour. Uh, the project was at 99% construction deliverables and the residents were invited just so that they could have a check mark on an attendance slip that they would submit to the city. On the other hand, architects talked about their favorite experience was redesigning a uh, new church that had been wiped out by Hurricane Katrina, but it had to merge two different racially diverse congregations. And so they used a series of participatory design workshops, educating the community about church architecture history and bringing people together over a shared experience of building something new. And so the idea that participatory design alone um, there's merit to it, but really seeing something be built, they describe, those architects describe seeing tears in the eyes of people who saw their voice, their vision translated into the architecture of the built environment. And so it taught me a lot that things need to be tangible for participatory design and for community health design to have a lot of impact. But what I did not expect was that my desk mate while I was working at EDR for the summer would be one of the biggest leaders in the na nation in terms of the movement for racial justice as it relates to the built environment. Brian C. Lee Jr. is a uh, architect. He's, he's the founder, a co-founder with Sue Mobley of uh, Colloquate, a wonderful design firm down in New Orleans doing incredible work. Check them out. Um, but Brian took off after we met. He, he really deserved to be in the fellowship role, not me. Um, and I learned from him. And so Design Justice is a platform that he has helped cultivate and develop. Um, he hosted in 2018, the Design Justice Summit that I mentioned earlier. And his work is incredible and will continue to move the field forward and working with uh, the DAP Collective. A couple of years ago, Brian called me up and said, we got to do a project pipeline in Kansas City. Project pipeline is a curriculum that he helped create um, educating youth because 2% of all registered architects are black in this country. And so Project Pipeline was about creating new opportunities for youth at a formative age to be introduced to design. I know I was introduced to design at seventh grade and that introduced me to a whole world. Um, Project Pipeline does that for those that might not otherwise have that opportunity. But it also serves the community by bringing young creative talent to mobilize around good ideas that can be designed for and with the residents that live in those neighborhoods. 
We organized Project Pipeline KC in about a month. We brought 30 residents together, architects from the NOMA chapter, National Organization of Minority Architects in Kansas City, and the students from the NOMA chapter at the University of Kansas, together with our community partners who introduced the issues of redlining, racism, gentrification, all of these things that impact their community today. The students had one day to design their response to the disinvestment through creative built environment solutions. They worked together in teams uh, at different age brackets. They came up with incredible ideas. They were mentored in this work through the project pipeline model with architecture students who look like them, who came from the same neighborhoods that they came from. And they worked together to create these incredible ideas that are very powerful and moving. Um, the second day we built them. We worked with our friends, Youth Build KCK. Again, remember my comment about long-term engagement. This is why we were able to, in one day, translate the designs that they had into construction prototypes that the youth themselves built. They learned about how to safely use power tools. They created their own installations. And in the second day, they were done with a rapid prototype of a idea. I'll just highlight two of them. Youth from a local high school, uh, young boys had this idea that, had this experience that sometimes when things flare up at the school, the aggression can lead towards gun violence. Well, they wanted to respond to that. So they created a, a water balloon fight station that would allow for them to uh, creatively address this issue. And so that was used by the youth at the end of the project pipeline. It was a really beautiful moment. There's a video for this. Um, the other group was young people and they decided that they wanted to uh, create a movable crossing guard that would allow for them to safely get to and from school because in many of their neighborhoods, there were no sidewalks for them to walk and they were forced to walk in the street. So the movable crossing guard idea emerged as a concept in their original site planning and then became a full scaled built prototype. Those youth were exposed to architecture and design and this letter here um, talks about how it helped sort of inspire them and they wanna to continue to do it. And I'm proud to say that Noma KC is leading that charge and keeping Project Pipeline as a staple in Kansas City and will host the next Project Pipeline this fall in 2021. And so this idea of diversifying the profession, bringing more different perspectives to the table, not just for community benefit, but also within the profession itself so that more people can have an impact on the built environment from different perspectives. And this work continues because right now, Groundwork NRG has a green team. It's youth environmental justice advocates, and they're responding to one of the demands that the DAP Collective, Designers Protest Collective made, which is to end crime prevention through environmental design. SEPTED, as it's otherwise known, is a community policing tool that is used to kind of create defensible space in public areas. So sight lines, lighting, litter, things like that. But what it also does is it's based on the broken windows theory of policing and that can lead to increased police presence in black and brown communities. So the DAP collective called on architects to create new creative alternatives to that. And what we did in with that agency and now in my role at Children's Mercy is introduce a different way of doing it with youth leading the charge. And so youth are creating the tools. They adapted our active living trail participatory mapping toolkit that they've put their own spin on it. They've changed it, they've mixed it up. And now it is their tool for creating uh, vibrant spaces and vacant lots and parks and hoping to encourage physical activity. Uh, just recently, they had a workshop with the, the community and then by that weekend, they took their uh, skills out and then made tangible improvements, planting trees and native grasses. They are installing green infrastructure in this vacant lot that the Groundwork Energy owns and they hope to continue this method, adapting and refining it as they go forward. So look out for the Green Team Toolkit at the end of 2021 and those youth will be leaders in our future. So to summarize what the implications are, for practice and for architects and for the built environment as a whole. Community health design is a public health platform where designers can collaborate with the communities that are closest to the public health issues manifested in the built environment while working together to improve public health through the building of trust and tangible outcomes while empowering residents to code lead the design process and make decisions together. Design with people for short. And where this might someday exist, because I have worked for firms, I have worked for nonprofits, I have worked in academia, I think it will make sense for community health designers and those practitioners willing to invest their careers into making this field happen, is look at 
healthcare, look at hospital networks because the IRS requires that nonprofit hospitals follow a community benefit standard, meaning that to maintain their tax exempt status, they must demonstrate and provide benefit to people that are represented as the community that they serve, and it must be for public and not private interest. There's no more tangible community-based approach towards improving health in the built environment than in taking this sort of community health design approach. And there's no better systemic funder that can support these efforts than hospitals, I believe, and healthcare institutions who are aware, and they have been for a long time, that the built environment impacts public health. Now is an, an opportunity to refine the education, the praxis, the pedagogy, and call for more consistent education and training and methods and ethics and rigor and research for community health design to have a real tangible impact in the communities that we hope to serve. So to summarize, um, and thank you for sticking with me, these are the basic steps, I think, for community health designers who wanna get started in this work. Get to know the community. They have cultural norms. They have informal and formal leadership. It takes time. Do not come in assuming you know everything. Work on projects that are community led. Just because there's a popular ordinance or a mission from a national leader some, in some other city does not mean it's gonna work in the community you're a part of. Identify who's already doing the work and support their efforts. They're there, trust me. Get to know them, be present. And be, building trust comes from being present and accessible as a resource. You have knowledge, you have skills, you can map, you can draw, you can create. Put that to service of community leaders. And translating those visions into real things is really where the challenge is. Partnering with groups like Youth Build or having a design build curriculum help. But really find ways to make sure that the participatory design doesn't just happen in thin air, but it really becomes something real, something people can touch, because that builds trust. Invite community members and youth to co-lead, whether that's through shared governance frameworks, whether that's through youth empowerment programs, workforce development, green infrastructure training, however you do it, bring them along with you. Work with youth, introduce them to the methods of design and have them co-lead with you so that they have those tools and they can be leaders in their own right as they go off into the world. And then stick around for the long term. I, I know I'm happy to say that I'm now a resident of Wyandotte County, which wasn't what I anticipated when I first started doing work here, but it's because the community relationships that I've built make this place a, a place to be a part of. It's a, it's a community that I'm proud to be a part of, and I'm thankful every day that the community partners I've worked with have trusted me enough to let me be a part of their community. Sticking around for the long term also allows opportunities to create new projects with new leaders, new opportunities, and I think it helps build power with those residents that for so long have been planned for, but not with. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope that this video uh, sparks some imagination or thoughts in the work that you do. And I look forward to hopefully hearing from all of you. You can see my email in the bottom and um, take care.